Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started with our program. Senator Paul is close. I'd like to thank everybody for making it out on a Monday for another one of our special chamber luncheons. At this time, I'd like to ask Pastor Mark Harrell, uh, Emeritus Pastor from Victory Christian Church, to please come forward to bless today's meal. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we just ask you to be the invited guest today. And Father, we do pray that you bless the food. Most of us have already eaten, so we thank you for it. And we bless the hands that have prepared it. And we do pray a blessing of our speaker, Senator Rand Paul, when he shares with us today. Lord, we have a room filled with leaders, different ones wanting to make a difference in business, in government, education, entrepreneurship, so many different areas. And Lord, we all need wisdom. Everyone needs wisdom. I'm reminded of the Bible, Father, in the book of James, if we lack and we ask of you, you will give us wisdom. So let us gain wisdom today that we need as we serve you and know you. Bless this day. We're careful to give Jesus all the glory. And everybody says, amen. God bless. Thank you very much, Pastor Harold. We sure appreciate you being here. Thank you. Uh, it's a true pleasure to host United States Senator Rand Paul today. Uh, very few chambers have the distinction of hosting two United States Senators in less than a one-month window. When it rains, it pours. We've been asking both these gentlemen to join us for a while, and, and when they want to come down, we make ourselves available. Uh, I think it shows the strength of our business support organization and the true impact that we are having on our local community. I'm going to keep my comments short, but in light of uh, recent events, uh, I am very, very excited to hear from Senator Paul today. Lunches like today are not possible without the generous support of our sponsors, and I'd like to personally recognize the Pulaski County Republican Party. Thank you all very much for sponsoring today. I'd also like to thank Kevin and Gina Buchanan and the Buchanan Estate for being our primary sponsors today. And I'd also like to recognize Thompson and Thompson Attorneys at Law for also making a donation to help sponsor today's luncheons. Let's give them a big round of applause. I want to make sure I see Lonnie out there. We start at the top. I want to thank Lonnie and the Center for the Rural Development for uh, always hosting us. I feel like I need to pull up a cot in the back here. We're here. We've been here a lot lately, and uh, and uh, you guys are wonderful to work with. Deborah, Laura, the whole group, Rod, everybody back there. Thank you all so much. I want to thank Sandy and Sassy Spoon Catering for another wonderful meal. Uh, she is working us into an already busy schedule when we call her up and say, hey, we've got a special luncheon that's not on the books. Can you please accommodate us? She always does, and we really appreciate you doing that, Sandy. And I want to thank our friends at uh, Pepsi and Coca-Cola for coming out and donating uh, drinks today. Uh, we, we take those things for granted, but we certainly don't here. We, we appreciate them very much, so thank you all. Um, one thing I want to mention on your tables, I see the bright yellow from here. You'll see some flyers. Uh, so our next regularly scheduled chamber luncheon is going to be on Tuesday, August the 6th. And I'm very excited about this one. Uh, our guest speaker is going to be Duke University Assistant Professor of Neurobiology, Dr. John Pearson. So you're probably thinking now, well, why is a, a, a neurobiologist from Duke University going to be here? Well, first of all, it's just kind of cool. I mean, that just seems like something that's out of the ordinary and very unique, but there is a great backstory. Um, Dr. Pearson is actually a native of Somerset and uh, currently an assistant professor of neurobiology at Duke. He earned his bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics from the University of Kentucky, and he got his PhD in physics from Princeton University. Sounds like you might know what he's talking about, huh? Um, 
I don't think he knows this, and I'm going to make sure to shamelessly embarrass him with this when he does show up in a couple of weeks, but uh, Dr. Pearson was actually the valedictorian of my senior class at Southwestern High School in 1996. So the most impressive part about that, he was 14 years old. So uh, I was never in the running for valedictorian, just to let you all know. Uh, but at 14, he had to stand on a box uh, to, to give his commencement speech. Uh, it's kind of a real Doogie Hauser kind of a story, you know. But I'm excited to tell him that story. I'm sure he doesn't remember me. He was really focused on school, and I, I wasn't. Um, but go ahead and mark your calendars. That should be a very, very interesting luncheon. He's going to be talking about how the brain works. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting luncheon. And, and again, you know, we enjoy bringing top-notch speakers into this community uh, and have those at our luncheons and have a very eclectic array of diverse people to come in. Uh, you know, so uh, Dr. Pearson will be here with us uh, next month. Um, before we get into our program, I'd like to ask Kentucky State Chamber Senior Vice President of Public Affairs, Kate Shanks, to please come forward for a special presentation. Oh, I gotta lower this mic. I'm a lot shorter than Bobby is. Thank you so much, Bobby, for giving us an opportunity to be a part of this program today, and we really appreciate our partnership with the Chamber. You all have an amazing chamber, and you know this because you are the chamber, but you have a really great team uh, with Bobby and his team and all the work that they do to advocate for, for you all directly as well as this region as a whole. So we greatly appreciate the partnership that we have with them and the opportunity to be down here today. And you're probably wondering why I've brought a, a baseball bat with me, but um, I'm excited because I get to present this award to a very important special legislator that's done really great work for the business community and for the region as a whole. And this is something that the chamber does. Um, at the end of every session, we sit down and we figure out who are our, our MVPs of the legislative session, who really went to bat for Kentucky businesses. And this is tough because there are 138 members of the General Assembly and we only give out a handful of these awards. And so I think there's something that are really special and, and very coveted by the members of the General Assembly. This past session, we saw over a billion dollars in savings for Kentucky businesses, and that's coming on the heels of a record-breaking session last year where it was around $1.5 billion in savings. So the General Assembly is doing incredible work for you all in terms of saving you money because of legislation they pass, because of investments they're making in your community, as well as legislation um, that they're stopping or halting that could be very costly for business. So you all, we have had some really great sessions these past few years, lots of savings for business. But for this award, we're always looking for that legislator that goes above and beyond, not just voting with us, but takes a leadership position on important issues. Maybe they cross party lines to vote with us, do something um, sometimes challenging or more difficult and this year I'm down here to present this award to Representative Josh Bray for all of the great work that he has done for the business community. He is vice chair of the House Appropriations and Revenue Committee. So he is in the room when some of the most important decisions are being made about the budget, about investment. And he's also playing a really important role as we navigate technology policy in Kentucky and co-chairing the AI artificial intelligence task force for us. Um, so we are just thrilled to have his leadership in the General Assembly. There's so much more that he's done, but for these reasons and all the others, please join me in thanking Representative Josh Bray for going to bat for Kentucky business. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, let's give Josh uh, another round of applause. Congratulations, Representative Bray. <laughs> Kate does a wonderful job for the state chamber. Uh, she is their policy enforcer, and she does a great job. She, she has one of those bats. 
she just carries around with her as a cap. No, she doesn't. Uh, she does a wonderful job. Thank you for being down here with us. Uh, at this point in time in the program, I'd like to go ahead. Uh, I'd like to introduce a, a true conservative patriot, uh, Pulaski County Judge Executive Marshal Todd. Could you please come forward? I know you're going to be introducing today's guest speaker. the senator just got here so he hasn't had time but to make a couple of bites so we're gonna catch him right in the middle of it but certainly glad to see everyone here today uh, it's a great afternoon in the light of events that happened yes or Saturday you know our, our nation is very fragile at this moment so just continue to keep the nation and our leaders in prayer because uh, you can see how short a lot of fuses are around the nation so just remember that as we go forward every day to day. It's my honor to introduce our guest speaker today. I've known Senator Paul for many years. I met him, met the senator at, uh, at an event right here in our small town of Nancy when he was first running for Senate in 2010. And I knew right then that he was going to be a champion for our constitutional liberties and physical responsibility, and he has certainly lived up to that belief. Appreciate that, Senator Paul. Just Senator Rand Paul is one of the nation's leading advocates for liberty. Elected to the United States Senate in 2010, Dr. Paul has proven to be a fierce advocate against government overreach and has fought tirelessly to return government to its limited constitutional scope. As a hardworking and dedicated physician, not a career politician, Dr. Paul came to Washington to shake things up and to make a difference. Dr. Paul is a devoted husband and father of three and has been married to his wife Kelly for 31 years. Dr. Paul and Kelly are both devout Christians and are active in their local church. Dr. Paul grew up in Lake Jackson, Texas and attended Baylor University. He graduated from Duke Medical School in 1988. Dr. Paul completed a general surgery internship at Georgia Baptist Medical Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and has completed his residency in ophthalmology at Duke University Medical Center. Upon completion of his training in 1993, Dr. Paul and Kelly moved to Bowling Green to start their family and begin his practice. Today, he serves on several important Senate committees, including the Committee on Foreign Relations, the Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, Committee on Small Business, and Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, where we see quite a bit of him on TV. So appreciate your work there. So would you all make welcome my good friend, Senator Rand Paul. Thank you, thank you. We are so lucky to have great news services in our country like CNN. Two days ago, you saw the headlines, blaring alert from Butler County, Pennsylvania. President Trump has fallen. His rally was interrupted because he fell. I kid you not, that was the headline. The Associated Press reported for the first several hours that the rally was stopped by loud noises. Now, I think they knew what was going on, but they weren't really being honest. I can tell you that when my wife and I were attacked in D.C., the Associated, report, Associated Press reported that a police officer protecting us was jostled. No, a guy tried to ram through and about knocked him over. He was falling backwards when I happened to catch his flak jacket or he would have fallen to the ground. When I reported, they asked me when I was running this last time around about 
what about my opponent? And I said, I don't think it'll be very popular to be for defunding the police. They wouldn't report that in the Associated Press. Usually that's your one chance to give your opinion on your other opponent. The Associated Press reported that we had differences on police, on policing issues. Well, that's not what I said. I said, I'm not for defunding the police. There's a difference. That's not a mild disagreement on whether, you know, what policing issues are. So it is amazing to have seen this come out. Now, some of the first impressions from people there were that they were unsure of the sounds, and I can, I can believe that. In 2017, I was at the ball field when Steve Scalise was almost killed, and I remember hearing the shots distinctively. I've grown up in a small town. I'm in Bowling Green where I live now. It's not uncommon to hear a shotgun. And I heard the first shot in 2017, and I thought, well, maybe it's a car backfiring. I wasn't sure what it was. But then when I heard 160 shots in succession, it didn't take me too long to take cover. I think we have to look at this and look at what we're going to do better. People say, oh, well, we need to have unity, and the rhetoric needs to be toned down. Of course it does. But I think we could be more specific. I think when the media spent a year and a half, maybe two years, saying that President Trump or former President Trump is a threat to democracy. Well, I lived through the Cold War. Soviet Union was a threat to democracy. And what do we do? We, we had our national defenses. We were ready to fight if the Soviet Union attacked. A threat to the democracy is something you're willing to commit violence to defend the democracy, to defend your country. To say that over and over, day in and day out, that Trump is a threat to our democracy is insightful. And it should stop. And I call on President Biden today to stop the rhetoric. I think it's time we stop it. <laughs> to compare former President Trump to Hitler over and over again in the mainstream media, really? To say he's going to become a dictator? All of these things, over and over, day in and day out, you know, there is no excuse. I mean, it's not the media's fault. It's the person's fault. It's only the person's fault who committed this. But the people who gin this up are inciting. Every community's got some crazy person out there that is being incited by the terrible rhetoric. So both sides could be better. Are there people on my side with bad rhetoric? Sure. It could all be calmed down. But at the same time, let's be specific. Calling someone a threat to democracy. Uh, saying that he needs to have a bull's eye on him, all said by President Biden in the last couple of weeks, that rhetoric needs to change. When I think of our country, I have nothing but warm, fuzzy thoughts of a great place. I see people from around the world who want to come here, people coming by the millions. Now, I don't think we can have an open border and allow millions of people to cross. I think you have to have a controlled border. But I'm not against people coming to our country. In Bowling Green, we have many good people who have immigrated to our country. Some of the best Americans, frankly, just got here. They have great work ethic, and they came here believing in the American dream. But it needs to be organized. They need to come to work. They should have sponsors. And it can't be millions of people coming from God knows where across the border. Some of them are from Egypt. Some of them are from China, all over the place. But we have to recognize why they're coming, what made our country great. President Trump is fond of saying, make America great again, greatest probably political slogan of all time. And yet we have to think about and remember what made America great. You want to make America great again? Great. What made us great in the first place? How did we become this beacon where people around the world want to come to this country? How did we get here? How did we get this far? If you talk to the, the billionaires in Silicon Valley, they'll say they're rich because they're smart. Well, sort of. Being smart is helpful. Being creative, selling something that people want, but their wealth and their great success wouldn't have happened in Venezuela. What's the difference between Venezuela and the U.S.? Venezuela has great natural resources, oil under the ground. The average person in Venezuela over the last several years has lost 30 pounds, not from dieting, from lack of food. Even with a larger, they have more oil in Venezuela than Saudi Arabia, and the average person is losing weight because there's not enough food. I wrote a book a few years ago with my wife, The Case Against Socialism, and in the opening chapters, we describe a young girl who's 16, and she's in charge of a gang, and her territory is three dumpsters outside of restaurants to guard the food scraps, to get the food scraps and control where the food scraps go to. That's what happens when you let government get out of control. 
That's a more serious debate we should be having instead of saying someone's a threat to democracy, which is better for our country, which is more consistent with our founding. What is the, what allowed us to create this prosperity? It was limited government. It was government that said your rights came from your creator. It was government that said that government was instituted to protect those rights but didn't create those rights. The Ninth Amendment says that these rights exist and if they're not listed, they're not to be disparaged. The Tenth Amendment says only certain powers were given to the federal government. They're few and limited. And the rest of the powers are left to the states and to the people respectively. I've seen how the government runs in Washington. You need to leave more in Frankfurt, more in Pulaski County, more locally. Why? Because your local government has to behave. They can only spend what comes in. Your county judge only spends what comes in. That's the rules. Your state legislature, by and large, does that. We still have some pension problems that can be figured out, but by and large, what comes in is spent. In fact, your state legislature has a rainy day fund. When we had the tornadoes in the western part of the state, they were able to write a $200 million check, not borrowed, but from cash on hand. When in eastern Kentucky the flooding happened, once again, $200 million very quickly went out. And I know there's some other guy that tries to take credit for this, but the state legislature did this against the wishes of that other guy. We won't name any names, for sure. <laughs> but you ask me, what kind of rainy day fund does the federal government have? Minus $34 trillion. That's, that's a real problem. I mean, we're the only government in the world, other federal governments may do this as well, but within the United States, we're the only government that has the ability to continue to misbehave and to continue to ask, act fiscally irresponsibly. And it goes on and on. And that's where inflation comes from. Now, if you watch some of the mainstream media, which I don't necessarily recommend, but if you watch them, they'll act confused and they'll say, well, it's just confusing, this inflation. Where did it come from? If you listen to my colleague, Elizabeth Warren, she'll say, well, the grocery stores are greedy. That's why meat costs more at the grocery stores. The, the people who own the grocery stores have gotten greedy. And my question, well, if that's true, when did they become greedy? They just all of a sudden this year or last year became greedy. They, they weren't greedy four years ago when there was no inflation, but they're greedy now. I would give you an F if you were in the third grade and told me that was your explanation. Seriously. But it's also an explanation that pits us one, one against another. Why don't we be angry at the person who owns the gas station because gas prices are going up? Why don't we be angry at the grocery store? It misplaces the whole thing and completely misunderstands the problem. There is no mystery to inflation. Inflation is caused when the government prints money. Why does the government print money? To pay for the debt. So we'll run about a $2 trillion deficit this year. About a third of that is bought by the general public. People can buy treasury bills. If you have a lot of money, you may put money in treasury bills. It's a fairly safe investment. About a third of it's owned by foreign countries. China's got over a trillion. Japan's got over a trillion of our debt. But then about a third of it every year is printed up by the Federal Reserve or bought by the Federal Reserve. And they don't have any money, so they have to create the money. When you create more money, it's great. If I give you twice as much money now and you work the same amount, you're twice as rich until everybody figures out that there's twice as much money and prices go twice as high. And the mysterious thing about inflation is not that it occurs, but it seems to go in fits and spurts. And it seems to be more in some areas than others. You tend to see it more right now in meat. You saw it for a while in gas. But there's a lot of things that enter into this, but inflation is caused by deficit spending. So how do you get rid of that? You quit spending so much. And people say, well, Certainly that's just the Democrats' fault. And I would say, to be fair, it's both parties' fault. Both parties have a miserable record when it comes to taxes, when it comes to spending. When it comes to taxes and regulation, I think there is a little bit more of a difference between the parties. For example, in 2017, we passed a significant tax cut. Only Republican votes. And this is just a fact, this isn't an opinion. Only Republicans voted for the tax cuts, Democrats had a sort of a newfound belief, oh, that they were against deficits. Well, the tax cuts didn't come to deficits, and the facts are out there. When you cut taxes in 2017, if you look at revenue in two-year cycles, and you look at the two years previous and the two years after and then two years after, revenue went down for about a year after the tax cuts. But if you look at it in two-year increments and measure it to the previous two years, revenue continued to climb. In fact, revenue was going up a steeper rate after the tax cuts. Why? 
Guess what? People work harder when they can keep more of their money. We changed the corporate tax from 35% to 21%. What did that mean? Less corporations were inverting and going overseas. A lot of them were going to Ireland and different places. Apple and all these big tech companies had trillions of dollars of overseas. We quit taxing it. We said you can bring it home for free, and most of it came home to the tune of trillions of dollars. That's why despite the horrendous policies that we have in place right now, we're still doing pretty well. It's also an indication that capitalism is incredibly resilient. There's a lot of build-up prosperity in our country, generationals. Most of you can tell that you have more wealth than the previous generation or the previous generation. We're all better fed. All of these things are good things, but we have to understand what made our country great so we don't allow this to slip away from us. Prosperity in our country and in the world is unparalleled. When people tend to get negative, and I can be uh, accused of being negative about the deficit and all the spending and all the problems we have, it's good to put it into perspective. For most of the history of the world, people have lived in abject poverty, almost everybody. If you go back to the time of King Henry VIII, the 1500s, there were no fat people other than King Henry VIII. You had to be royal, and those were the only people who had enough food. Everybody else was starving. That's really true until about 1820, when the Industrial Revolution happens, and I think Al Adam Smith sort of presaged this with his book, A Wealth of Nations. When the Industrial Revolution starts, virtually everybody lives on $2 a day or less. That's considered to be severe poverty. You do same dollars and you move it forward to today, instead of 98% of the people living in utter and abject poverty, it's less than 10% worldwide. Adam Smith described how this prosperity came about. Low taxes, small government, balanced budgets, leave people largely alone and the people who sell the best stuff at the cheapest price will prosper and they will continue to prosper. The division of labor was an enormous thing. All of a sudden people specialized. Everybody didn't have to make their own shoes, their own clothes, their own food. We began to specialize and that specialization multiplied the wealth. The division of labor then spread among countries, and we had international trade. This is something that I think the Republican Party is in danger of losing sight of. International trade is good. The average person who shops at Walmart saves $1,000 a year. Now, if you own the local hardware store that Walmart put out of business, you may not love Walmart, and there still is some of that. But the by and large, the, the facts are in. These retail stores and international trade do save us money. In the 1980s, I remember people were upset with Japan, and they were like, oh, they own Rockefeller Center, they're going to own all of America, we don't want the Japanese to own America. But you know, if you go to Georgetown, Kentucky right now, you don't hear a lot of complaints. The Toyota factory has 10, 15,000 jobs, they're making, you know, probably between 60 and $150,000 on the line. I mean, these are good paying jobs. There are other companies. We now have people, Nippon Steel is wanting to buy U.S. Steel, and people are going crazy on both sides of the aisle. So we can't let the Japanese own U.S. Steel. Well, if they don't, there may be no U.S. Steel. And U.S. Steel was largely beleaguered by American antitrust cases and regulations. Nippon Steel already buys metallurgical coal. They're doing business in Kentucky. There are Kentucky jobs. You know, one of the few coal things that's doing pretty well is metallurgical coal. That coal's being sold, sold some to Nippon Steel. We should stay out of the way. There's no reason to condemn this purchase. It'll actually backfire on us and probably cost us jobs. But now the hysteria is more shifted towards China. We, oh, we're okay with Japan now, but it's towards China. And look, I don't like the Chinese government. I wrote a whole book called The Deception, the, the Great COVID Cover of how they covered up you know, the fact that I think the disease came, the, the virus came from Wuhan, from a lab accident, and yet, while I have no love of the Communist Party and the government of China, I don't want to cut off trade because trade is most part good for our country and good for each individual. We actually have a company in Kentucky owned by Chinese businessmen and uh, 1,500 Kentuckians work there. So we have to be a little careful about nationalism. Am I proud of my country? Without question. It's the best place ever to live. But I don't want to cut off trade from people I don't like. Saudis, I didn't like the Saudis you know, killing Khashoggi, chopping him up and throwing his body parts out of a plane. Disgusting, medieval, terrible. I don't want to have dinner necessarily with them, but I don't want an embargo on Saudi Arabia. We have to figure out that the benefits to trade 
are incredibly good, and we have to be careful about, you know, sort of isolating ourselves from the rest of the world with trade protection. When I look at the future of our country, though, I'm incredibly optimistic. If we remember what made this country great, I think we'll continue in that vein. I will continue to fight to defend your individual liberty, your constitutional rights, and to make sure that government is fiscally responsible, conservative in every way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Paul. Uh, really want to thank everybody for coming out. I want to thank my chamber board. I want to thank our ambassadors who helped check everybody in, my employees over there, over at the chamber. They're wonderful. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Pulaski County Property Valuation Administrator T.W. Todd to please come forward and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll conclude today's luncheon. I'm sure Senator Paul might stick around for a couple of photographs. <laughs> 